Safi. Okay, that didn't work, right? Like as I expected. So maybe Safi Baraka. Okay, so now. Okay, okay so the last part, I mean, we, it's only one more hour, and I think I'll actually have less. So we will have probably like half an hour for questions. And for those who have the software, you can play around and keep asking me questions. But this last hour, throughout the day, what I went through is basically like a very, like a summary of what I teach in five months. So you could imagine that I, I tried to condense a lot of things. I speak fast too, so I was like going through da, 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 da. Uh, But I just wanted you to have like, you know, all, as much information as possible from today so that you learn something, and hopefully you did. But now it's like, uh, in the real life, most of you, if you start doing consulting and so on, you really won't care too much about the details of the engineering, you know, the equations behind the solar field losses and so on but you do need to understand them. Today though, we have a lot of software that does that for us. Like we have a lot of software that calculates losses in the field, but if the software tells you cosine effectiveness are minus 100, you should know that this is wrong because cosine effectiveness go from zero to 100. If the, so if the software tells you cosine effectiveness goes, uh, it's 100% uh, for a single axis tracking system, then you, sh you should know now that this is not right or stuff like this, okay? Uh, that's why we need to study, not only just use the software, but in reality then you most likely will end up using a software, and then you will have questions about it, and then you will ask people who know how to use it, and then that's why I get paid. But in reality, you just apply this. There's one software that, I don't know if you got the message, but I told uh, um, uh, Nuha or Maha to, um, so that you can um, download it, because this is free, so you can uh, download um, the system advisor model from the NREL website. And it looks like this, I just open it. So, so if when you open it, I actually, maybe I should just go back so that I can see literally how you open it. So let's say, this is when you open it, okay? So when you open SAM, and this is the last version of SAM, it has varied a lot throughout the years, you have a number of predetermined systems that you can play with inputs to get the performance. The performance, measured in terms of the objectives that I said before. It could be LCOE, it could be annual yield, etc. But then you can do, I mean, here you can see that it's not only for CSP, it, it actually SAM has a lot of PV, they have win, and etc. But SAM historically has been, actually, if you look at the number of CSP technologies there, ha SAM has historically, um, I don't know, like known for CSP, more than for any others. Actually, for the PV industry doesn't use SAM. Uh, is, uh, I don't know if, if you went through some yesterday, but there's PVCs. I mean, that's the standard for CSP. In the CSP industry, SAM is uh, known by everyone, used by everyone at some point, but we don't really use it for the final stages of the project, just still as a prefeasibility tool that is very easy to use and stuff like this. And if you look at SAM, um, I mean, it's obvious that it's most mainly uh, a CSP because you look at all the number of CSP systems in there compared to the other technologies. So let's open the uh, tower one. So Danny asks you for which type of financing. Since you're not here on finance, uh, all I would say is that you can open the first one, which is the power purchase agreement, single owner. I mean, the whole single owner or, or, or partnership flip with debt or sell lease back defines the, the way the cash flows are happening. So single ownership is the easiest because that basically means that you as a single entity put, for instance, 20% of the money, and you as a single entity ask for a number of banks or one bank for the rest of the money. It's the easiest model to build financially. But usually, most of the projects are built with a partnership flip with debt, which is something like uh, you are a single owner, but at the same time you have creditors with you that put money at the beginning, that are not necessarily the banks, uh, which with, I mean, that you are gonna give the plan to them after a number of years, that's what there's called a flip. Uh, and also they're called flip because mainly the first 10 years are of cash coming to the plan are only for the banks and then for the owners. 
So this is usually what is a build like, but for the purpose of the example, I mean, and since we're not going to, this, is, this applies to all type of project financing. We just go to, okay, power uh, purchase agreement, single owner. And then you have a number of design questions or what it goes. So I'm just gonna go today through these blocks. So the first thing it will ask you, the software will ask you, first, keep in mind what is molten salt tower system. I mean, this is what, what I showed later um, before, you know, the, the tower with the molten salts that get hot. They put it, they, once they're hot, they're in a hot tank. When they're cold, they're in the cold tank. When they're in the hot tank, they can t be taken so that they produce steam, right? That's uh, the main blocks and stuff like this. Um, so keeping in mind the, 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 the blocks, the software asks you for design questions at each of the blocks. That's the thing. Um, the main one depends only on the location. So the software allows you to um, input any location, actually. And it comes with some weather data in already in it. Uh, uh, the last version, though, comes only with US data. And I think also some basic data, um, for instance, I'm quite sure there is like Casablanca. Like for, so there is some airport data, like Air Mohammed 5 uh, Casablanca airport data there. So uh, these are all TMY data. TMY data is what I was saying before. So it's like, you know, it says that like download TMY data or build your own TMY data. Uh, this is stands for typical meteorological year data. And TMY data is data that is built. I mean, if you look at it, it's just a file that has a column with hour of the day, a column with a uh, solar resource, um, meaning global horizontal radiance, a column with beam irradiance, a column with diffuse irradiance, a column with wind uh, speed, a column with relative humidity, a column with uh, uh, wind speed direction, a column with, uh, you name it, uh, visibility, depending on which type of technology we have, which type of uh, data file. So now this file, this weather data, is not data measured for one single year or, or two years. When you have data for a single year, that is not called TMY, that is called time series. So time series data. For design purposes, we use TMY data. TMY data is basically resulting from a number, from a combination of time series data, so something I measured, hopefully from, for, a longer, for a long period of time, together with data that is satellite. Data that is from available from 20 years in the past, 40 years in the past, so that I can build correlations to know, you know, if I look at the 21st of June at, 12, uh, at, uh, at noon for, a num for 20 years, that would give me more or less, if I just treat the data, what would be the typical 21st of June solar noon weather conditions. That's why it's called a TMY. Now the TMY, uh, in projects, we ha like to say, oh, it's differentiated in terms of P50 and P90 TMY. This is another concept you can write down, but um, this gets more specific. But the thing here with P50, P90 is that P stands for probability. And so a P50 is 50% odds that this is correct. Um, P90 is 90% odds that this is correct. That's what it means. And of course, then a P90 TMY data is more conservative than a P50 TMY data. I mean, a P90 might give a DNI of 2000, whereas a P50 of 2150. Because you are at least secure in that, no, this is like, at least like this. You know, 90% of the chances that this is like this. The more you go into a project, of course you need P90 data. I mean, you know, no one puts more money unless you have a P90 data. I was asked during the lunch break or whatever, uh, if you would need to be an engineer to be in this field. And um, well, you saw already that no, uh, you could be a, a financial stakeholder. I know about finance only. You could be someone that is knowing about the environment only because you need a lot of permits and assessment for this. And simultaneously, you could be someone that doesn't necessarily need to be a mechanical engineer, material engineer, but someone that focuses only on the resource. So someone that is, there's a lot of job uh, when it comes to solar energy, people building TMY data people that understands how to provide the typical weather data based on past measured data, based on current measured data, uh, based on treatment of the data, a lot of stochastic statistics and so on. So there's a, this is a possibility and so on. This you don't need to be a mechanic engineer to be. This is another career path, you know? 
So once you define this data, so for here, uh, what the software comes with is either you upload yours, so you can put yours, um, or you take one from whatever is available in the system. And here, um, I chose one, it's a Daggett, so you can here search for it, and then I chose Daggett, and then basically it will read it from my computer, which is here in this folder, and tell me Daggett is in California, USA, uh, Daggett has an elevation of 588 meters. And this format is just the format in which the TMY is written. Uh, so TMY, it's uh, a standard dies today. So TMY2 and TMY3 is just how the format of the file looks like. But at the end of the day, it's the same. It's just the date of the weather at every hour. Then it tells me um, this is the time zone, the GT GMT minus A the actual position of Daggett, which I know for calculating all the solar position, right? And, uh, and that the data comes from one station, which is probably, like I said before, in most of these databases that are free, anything that you can find is just airport data, which is not the best, out of, num out of a number of reasons. The thing is that one of them is, first, you most likely don't wanna build one of these projects next to an airport, so the only reliable data you have it's usually from airports, but you're not gonna build one next to airports, which means that then to get to this, uh, most of the software, what they do, uh, there are other software for this, but like uh, Metronorm is another software that basically if you input coordinates, it gives you, it creates a, a TMY, a, a, a typical meteorological geodata file, and it creates it by interpolating three different airports data, for instance. So you're like triangling the, the data available. And this is not accurate, but it gives you a list something to begin with for the calculations of your system, right? Uh, then at the end, what we need is a combination of this satellite-based interpolation and, or interpolation from available weather stations together with on-site measurements. So part of the time when you look at the you know, project takes six, time, six years or three years or something, part of that time is actually while all the admin work is ongoing, real measurements are happening. So that then we can more or less validate what the time, what the TMY says, and what our measurements were. They will not look the same. They will not be the same, and they should not be the same, because the TMY reflects 20 years of history and so on, and the measurement on site is just what happened that day. Uh, but they, the pattern should be such that you could reflect, you could see that the data more or less behaves as the TMY says, and so on. Um, okay, so here you just, in this software, you specify the location, and oh basically, the software is so flexible that it allows you to put the input, you choose which city, and then that's it. You, you get, it reads all the hourly data, where, I mean, DNI, wind, et cetera. Then if you go to system design, remember we, we said um, a tower with storage, so it looks like this, you know? We have different blocks. We have the solar field, which is this and this. We have the, the red line here, which is the heat pump fluid, or the molten salts uh, cycle, and uh, with the tanks, the receiver, and then we have the heat exchangers, and then the power block. So it asks you for first, at a system level, some issues. First, this you should understand. I mean, the idea from today is that at least you understand what to input. So nothing sounds weird or 100% weird. Sometimes it does sound weird because it uses different nomenclature, but at the end, you should know now some basics here. So to design a field, you need a design point. This is what we've been saying throughout the day as nominal conditions and so on. So you, can, you, you need to estimate how many heliostats you need depending on the type of heliostat you have and the actual conditions that are given a specific point. You could do that by saying solar, noon, summer, solstice, which means read the file and tell me what is the irradiance or the irradiation at 12 in 21st of June. So read the file I said before and tell me what are the conditions. Use them, or use those as uh, boundaries. But we don't usually do that. Instead, we just say, we input our, our design conditions. That's like, because sometimes it could be that the TMY data at that specific point, even though it's supposed to be theoretically one of the best because it's the summer solstice and so on, it could be that most of the times in that location, that's the only time when it rains for any reason. So like you design for, you say, okay, let's design for summer solstice, meaning the sun is at this angle. And let's design for 
this design point, you know, like the sun, the beam irradiation design point DNI is 950. Uh, the solar multiple is also a design variable that we discussed before, which is basically a ratio of the, the power collected from the field with regards to the nominal thermal power required by the power block to operate at nominal capacity. That's why it's nominal in between. So if I start varying this, you see how the receiver will start varying. Um, so uh, I don't know, let's say one. So 279 will be the one, the same. I mean, if my solar multiple is one, the receiver is sized such that it delivers exactly the thermal power from the cycle. Look at it here, this is the thermal power. The thermal power from the cycle in this example is set to 115. And if I assume a uh, net to gross conversion efficiency of 3.9, that means net power of 104. And if I assume this efficiency, so all of these are inputs, then this is the thermal power. So this you can see here clearly what the solar multiple means. So it's the ratio between the thermal power of the receiver and the, uh, or the nominal thermal power of the receiver at these sign conditions and the cycle thermal power. Um, so let's say 1.5, whatever. And then this is just a multiplier of how much more the field, the collector part, should give to the receiver. Okay? Um, let's keep it at one. Then you have the conditions at which you want the salt to operate. I told you before, the molten salts um, have an, an issue that is that they freeze below 270 degrees, they degrade above 580. So these are just basically inputs that need to be within those values because otherwise it's not physically realistic like to run the problem. Uh, and then, well, you have some margins here as you can see. I mean, of course, you cannot heat it up up to 580 because there will be times that at which it will be higher and vice versa. But the software will do it. It's just that we know physically that this is not possible. But I mean, the software is the software, so you can do whatever. That's why you need to know the, the background to it. And then the last question in, from a system perspective, so these are the main sizes, right? We're talking about size of the field, solar multiple, size of the receiver, and solar multiple, power cycle size, um, thermal energy storage size. So the thermal energy storage size, it's like we said here, 10 hours. Then, the, n then the you can go to each block. So one is the heliostat field. The software comes in with a, you can either you can either input yourself where should each heliostat be. That's why it calls for import here. So if you have another tool that is designed for laying the layout, you know, putting the heliostats, then you can get the file x y and put it here in stamp. Otherwise, it comes in with a simple optimization tool uh, that actually takes some time, so I don't want to run it. But you just say for the given design conditions, you click on optimize for the given for this inputs. Here, it will, it will provide you with a layout. And a layout, I mean here, all these points. Each point here is the heliostat. So the point, the center part is the, where the tower is going to be. And then you see the distance in kilometers, in meters in this case. So, but to do, to, that, to do that optimization, the tool requires, of course, some inputs, which is like the character properties of the heliostat. And here you have the heliostat dimensions, so width, height, or the, the, the mirror area per heliostat. The reflectivity, as I said before, so no, there's no such a 100% reflective mirror. Um, the image error, again, um, the image and tracking errors are errors that are connected to uh, the quality of, like, the slope error is an error if the mirror, if the facet, is that the mirror, like, is not entirely flat or as it should be, I mean, like, no, no disturbances, then the image error will be, the slope error will be zero. But realistically speaking, this is not the case. There will be imperfections in the, in the mirrors. Uh, minimum, I mean, we're talking about milliradians here. So milliradians, but milliradians make a difference. So that's uh, what a slope, a slope error is. Um, this image is a combination of a slope error with tracking error. Tracking error is the other one, which is that there is a bit of offset. If you look at, remember the picture that I shown where you had the the receiver, and then there was like an aim, uh, like a target. Uh, that shape might be circumferential. If you have a lot of, if you have a big slope error, it's not circumferential, but more like elliptical. And if you have a tracking error, 
and a slope error, then it's both elliptical and not where it's supposed to be. Like it's somewhere like uh, a bit off, you know? That's what we call by image error. And you can, you can quantify that by million readings. Um, the number of facets relates to, if you remember the picture, the helis tests are not just one single mirror, are a number of mirrors, and those are facets. So this is just asking how many facets in the x direction, how many facets in the y direction. If you have a mini field, it might be that it's only one, like one and one, it's only one small helis test. And there are fields that are mini, like small fields, where you're talking about uh, four meter squares, which means like two times two, which will fit here. And then you, they ask you about LAN. It's, an, it's, a, it's a US software, so it, it doesn't in Akers, but for some reason. But. Um, do you have some technical aspects here concerning the operation of the heliostat? As you could imagine, the heliostats theoretically, of course you could set this to zero, meaning that they could position themselves like this or like this, Realistically speaking, actuators will not allow them to do that. So then you, you can set those type of things here, which is like, oh. <laughs> you can set those inputs here, which is like, what is the actual minimum angle that the head is that, I mean, at stow position can achieve, uh, at which, uh, until which wind speed the head is that can operate. So remember, we are reading with the data. So the software allows you to, allows you to tell me, uh, you know, up from this wind speed, the software, sh the, the heliostats should go to emergency position, which is like they just go like this. Or each heliostat actually will have their own emergency mechanism. The reason why we need, I mean, emergency control for wind speeds is that, as you saw earlier today, we could have a tornado, we could have a different uh, like things happening in the field, right? So these are structures. And by exposing them to higher wind speeds, they might break, they might failure. So from an operational point of view, we do set limitations. And this become really important when it comes to contractual issues because there is a contractual relationship between the one that provides the health stats and the one that operates the plan. If you, for any reason whatsoever, as an operator, operate when the plan, uh, when a wind speed that is above like the wind speed that I set in my contract, then I might just say, my service contract is over and you need to pay anyway, but you were the one that is responsible for it because you broke it. You operate when it's not supposed to and so on. Anyway, you have a lot of input here, like, you know, as you could imagine, in the early phases, when the plant is just start ramping up, you uh, need energy for the storage, for the heliostat to move, and you might not have energy from the field. Uh, or even when it's operating, you might need to take energy from your plant to move the heliostat. So these are the type of inputs you're asked here. Um, when it comes to atmospheric attenuation, I don't want you to get into too much into what it is. This Coefficient, but what I, I do want you to keep in mind is that attenuation is one of the main losses in towers, right? We s went through that. And attenuation is directly linked to how far my heliostat is from the tower. I mean, it's directly linked to the, the distance between the center of my heliostat to the receiver, I mean, that path, because the longer this is, the more ma the light goes through particles, scattering, etc. Now, uh, the way we model this is by, uh, there is a visibility theory, but in some, but they, the model they use is just a polynomial uh, one, that is, the, the polynomial comes from visibility. It's not obvious here, but we can derive these polynomial coefficients based on um, visibility data. And then what it means is that if you input the distance, so the kilometers from, I mean, the center of the heliostat to the center of the receiver in kilometers, and you use this coefficient, it will give you the attenuation for each heliostat. That, that's it. So, and you have different orders. So like this is times uh, one, this is times x, this is times x squared of x, etc. cetera. Um, of course, you have some constraints. I mean, you might, you can input in the tool a shape of the land, or you can input like, you know, what is the maximum uh, distance of the field, the last heliostat to the tower, et cetera. That's the type of things the tool asks you for. So this is from the field perspective, and if you input all of this in the field, and also the tower and the receiver, like this is set, all the blue ones we set already before in the system design, but you have a possibility to dimension the tower, I mean how high should it be, the receiver itself, you know how many panels, uh, the diameter of the receiver, uh, the height of the receiver, 
All of these are criteria for the, the mentioning. And even the, the, the software even allows you to choose different materials, different metals and coatings for the receiver. So when you input all of these data in the receiver tower specifications and heliostat specifications, you can go back to heliostat field and then click on optimize or generate layout. And then for a given number of uh, boundaries, like if you say tower between 100 and 150 and so on, it will optimize to or generate a layout for you using a simplistic or a simplified, I wouldn't say simplistic, but a simplified mm -hmm. linear optimization tool that is integrated in this, but that you can also download for free. The software is called Solar Pilot. So if you download Solar Pilot, uh, you can do only layout generation, for instance. Now that's a free software. But Sam has a version of Solar Pilot uh, in, in, in it. Then when you, when you have dimension the field for the given design conditions, uh, you do the same for the power cycle. We already said in the system design the, the capacity, the gross, but you can go more specific, which is that which type of cycle, uh, at which pressure should be operated, which type of cooling, like air cool, uh, dry cool, um, sorry, wet cool, um, startup times, you know, it takes time for a steam cycle to ramp up. And uh, you can quantify that with real mechanical engineering, but in the tool you can put simple approaches like half an hour, one hour. Uh, you can input all of that in the tool. Then you have the same for thermal energy storage. You know, uh, in this case, it gives you the option to choose, but in reality, no. You can only choose a two tank in this, in this, in this uh, particular tower salt single owner system. And you can input you know, the tank height, the minimum height of the fluid, uh, how many tanks will you have, um, or pairs of tanks, uh, and then some inputs with regards to the losses. So. In you could, if you do detailed component modeling, by this I mean this software is called System Advisor Model. So it's like, at a simplified way, we're gonna model the system. But a system is composed of many components, right? So a real and a real engineering work, we need to model the components detailedly, so that then we can input these simplified inputs here. Only by modeling the component, I really know what is my cold tank heat capacity. Or my uh, or the losses um, per meter meter square Kelvin. I mean, you need to model it because it depends on the insulation you choose. It depends on how the recirculation is happening in the tank. So for that, you will need to do a component model in a multi-physics software that does that is taking care of component modeling only. When you do that, you understand that, and then you can use this tool for inputs. But if you do want to do just you know generic assumptions, these are typical values. The software comes within with all of these typical values. So. That that's which is good for someone new, allows you to play with it. Then this is all the physical dimensioning that is in there, but as we were discussing before, the physical technical dimensioning is one thing that is alone nothing, because we just don't design something to be the most efficient. As an engineer, we want something that is the most cost efficient. So then the system takes care of the, uh, the software allows you to play with how it should operate, so there are a number of inputs here, mainly not in system control. And system control is about um, the parasitic. Parasitic is uh, energy requirements from the own plant to operate. So you know, if a turbine is, you know, you saw as an input there, there is like um, the power plant capacity, gross capacity is 110. Most likely the net capacity is 100 because I need 10 megawatt to run. I need energy for the pumps. I need energy for moving the helistats. I need a lot of energy, on, I mean, for the fans in the, in the, in the cooling, in the, in the condenser, et cetera. This is what you input here. So all the parasitic energy. But then this is the fun one, it's, it's cost. This, I mean, the software comes in with some cost suggestions, but uh, they are meaningless. I mean, this is just some costs that you need to validate each time you're gonna build. I mean, you, of course, every result will be very sensitive to <laughs> what you put here. Uh, uh, but uh, this is it. I mean, like what you use here is what will determine what is optimum. This, uh, if you put the heliostat cost zero, it will suggest a massive heliostat field because I mean they're zero, so <laughs> we want just more energy. Reality is that heliostats are somewhere. I mean, these these numbers are not so wrong though. I mean, like a heliostat field, in, like in real bits, are varying anything in between 120 to 140. Yeah, give or take depending on where you are, et cetera. 
Uh, but here you go, like, like, like I was explaining in my slides, like component by, like block by block, it asks you for costs. So the tower, fixed cost plus cost with uh, height. So the higher, it should be higher, more costly. Uh, the receiver, costs that are scaling with the thermal power, etc. And then you need, of course, lifetime for the calculation. Um, the degradation is usually zero, as I said before. And I think um, in, those, in, this, in, in the tool, it leaves you like uh, the option in the financial parameters to set the how many years is the so the analysis the period so 25 years, and then my equity or my the project's target for profits should be met at 20, for instance. So like all of this is our inputs here. I, of course, we have like a one single lecture today for everything, but we did touch a bit on this. So if you get start playing with this, my purpose is that you at least understand some of it. You know, like, uh, because we design, I said it already, yeah, we're engineers, it's fun to work on this, but this is a business. So behind all of this, it's not only a business, but there are different actors. And each actor makes money in their own way. The profit here relates to the project. So it's like the whole project course, as a, as a, the power plant as an entity makes money in this way. This is an IRR of the project. But then as a supplier of heat exchangers, I might have a different profit margin. And as a supplier of Helistat, I might have a different profit margin. This is a whole, I don't know, like masters on its own, but just so that you keep the notion of that everything we do in terms of engineering is connected to cost. <coughs> and, co and this cost will determine ultimately whether this project is viable or not, okay? The tool gives you this, the option to, to actually set all of this. This last block, um, before I click simulate, is just, uh, remember when we were showing right before the break that you might be paid differently. The, top, the, the best thing about SAM, actually, it's the only reason why sometimes I use SAM, to be honest, is the dispatch optimizer. So SAM has a, a very good dispatch optimizer, meaning that based on the price, so all you see here, this matrix, and I'm gonna go there. Ah. So this matrix is So this matrix here is, remember the slides I was showing before where you were paid three times in the evening, paid 100% during daytime, paid zero during nighttime. You can put this here in this, I mean, this, the tool allows you to put this. So basically it says, define as many periods as you want. And then you say, you know, period one, you're paid two times. Period two, you're paid 1.2. Period three, you're paid one time. And then you can say for every month, every hour, which period is what? So one of the best things of this tool, I mean, of SAM in general, is this dispatch optimizer tool because it connects a real sizing plant with some kind of revenue stream, with some kind of uh, how you're paid, and it dispatches the storage around this to maximize the profit, to minimize the PPA. So I think that's it. I mean, now uh, once you've done this, then it's just basically you simulate. So we put all the inputs. Hopefully this doesn't crash. It's usually very fast. And then the tool simulates the performance for you, meaning it will calculate LCOE, PPA, uh, capacity factor, whatever objective you have. You know, like all these parameters, they are quantified. Hopefully it finishes some one day. Um, yeah, it's soon to finish. So there you go. So these are all the performance indicators of my plan. So for a given size that I input, you saw all the inputs, we said a tower height this much, capacity this much. Uh, we put a price scheme, right? We said period one, period two, and so on. Then it tells me your annual energy in year one is this much. We set degradation to zero, which means that the annual energy in year 20 is gonna be the same. If you put degradation, at then at year 20, it's gonna be lower and so on. Uh, capacity factor, now you know what it means, ZNEP. Do you remember what it means? Okay. <laughs> so the capacity factor is just, okay, this plant is available 60% of the time. And you have water usage, you have the PPA, which you see is 10.25, and it's not necessarily the same as the LCOE. You see how the LCOE is varying here. The reason why it's not the same is if you go back to the par financial parameters, first of all, we have, a, we have a price scheme. Whenever you have a price scheme, the PPA will not be the same as the 
L3. So forget about it. That already there, I knew that this was not going to be the same. But even if you fix the price scheme the same, like one, all of them, the LCOE and the PPA are not the same just because this refers to the first year PPA and it's escalated with this factor and it's escalated also with inflation or uh, every year. So the tool gives you all of this and it's just so that you understand. So like you see here, for instance, based on the inputs we said, this is the equity part. This is the money that comes from owners directly from direct investors. This is the size of the debt uh, that we should be refinanced and so on, this is the IR. The IR is achieved at year 20, et cetera. So you can get all this information and then you can also plot it. Uh, the tool is, is super use, I mean like, is fr user friendly. So you have any, I mean, since we put no degradation, of course this is the same production every year, that's why this graph is boring. But you have main, um, like all the cash flows, so you have like, if you look at the cash flows, this is just a very simple financial model because we put single owner in single ownership, what it means is that at the, year, at the first years, we, put, we had to invest a lot, and then we start getting money back. That's, that's the whole thing of the, of the, of the project. And, uh, but you can look at all of this and, uh, and actually plot more. If you click here, oh, here I have it, uh, graphs. You can create a graph with whatever um, value you choose here to have or so on. Either capacity, like either performance indicators, or you say like, you know, hourly data for. If, I, if I'm interested in something more technical, you know, what was the receiver temp in the temperature at all the times? So the receiver inlet, you know, the temperature coming into from the call tank to the receiver, I can plot it. And I told you before, the tanks the freeze at 260 to 80, so they will never be below 280 or 260. It actually, it's like 260. But you see how it gets cold. I mean, of course, this is. Uh, Daggett, so here's where we see more variation, but uh, I mean, not directly connected. But you see how the temperature is varying. I mean, this is a dynamic system, which is what I wanted to show. And you can plot this for all the different, I mean, like for solar irradiation, for HDF, for the thermal energy, etc. Okay, so having said that, I think that's it. So I don't know if I will check the, the questions to see if we have some. Oh, I don't have that. This is my computer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so do you have any question? <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe. Or if you connect here. Oh, well, no, I don't have internet, so you can connect. I don't know if uh, for the IT will connect this computer, or I don't. I don't know if, if I just open it and see the questions. Oh yeah, it's just easy like this. Okay, so we have some questions here. Um, what's the meaning of TMY two? So forget about the two or three. Uh, this is just uh, like uh, the way the data sets are structured. I mean, in reality, it's the it's the same data. I mean, like in one column you have. Uh, time, hour, in another column you have minutes, in another column you have irradiation uh, beam, in another column you have irradiation diffuse, etc. Uh, so the way you structure it, one is time y2, time y3. Okay? Oh, sorry, you just write this. Is I should be faster answering back then. <laughs> okay. Uh, does high exactitude data cost a lot? How much? Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing is like the precision and accuracy of the cost data. First of all, no one shares. So like no one that has any cost data shares it with anyone. Um, and when you do get it, you need to sign a lot of confidential agreements and so on. Um, what you can find, if you just Google for my name on like uh, solar towers, you have a lot of, uh, I actually published a paper last year that is uh, about typical cost ranges for solar towers. So you have per <laughs> system some values, but in reality to build a detailed cost model, you need to get quotations and these, these are private and only specific to a specific location and so on. So it's not something that is useful for any other location. Uh, I still couldn't grasp how can salts freeze at 280 degrees. 
Well, I mean, this is just, I mean, I guess it's not so intuitive, but the thing is that sol these are molten salts, so our, uh, they are um, salts that can be found naturally in Chile, but also be manufactured by some companies in Europe. Uh, the, the whole thing is that this, the properties of these salts are useful for us in the industry just because the range of operation is between 280 to 60 up to 580. But this is just the material. I mean, this is the media. So, um, I mean, the mixture is such that it freezes at that point. I mean, it's like I told you before, aluminum is solid up to 580. It's the same thing. I mean, this is another material. So uh, aluminum is solid at 580. You need to put it hotter than 580 so that it becomes liquid. This is the salt. The salt is liquid only above 280. Is there, oh. does the type of the test affect the receiver thermal power? Uh, not directly, uh, but it could. Uh, depending on the type of test, I mean the thermal energy storage, uh, you could limit the power that the receiver is able to provide to it, or the way that the receiver can provide to it. So depending on the technology, you might limit the operation of the receiver, but in reality the receiver is to some degree more or less independent, I mean the receiver design is to some degree more or less independent from the thermal energy storage. Is there any open sources to download TMY files acceptable by SAM? I think my students found some called like HelioClean uh, to come find some locations there. Um, but in most of the cases, these are data that you just need to find. <laughs> like literally, you, most of them you ask you to pay for. But in SAM, you do find a couple of locations for Morocco. In addition to cost, what are the criteria to take into consideration when choosing the single area of the helistat? Oh, there are many. I mean, the helistat has, uh, it's a combination. I mean, cost, of course, but as I said before, the helistats have properties, like technical properties. I mean, the, the helistats, you want them to be able to move freely in, the, in both directions. Only some actuators allow you to do that. Depending on, depending on the geometry you choose, you might move, um, like, I don't know, like east, west, and north, south, but or else, uh, you can also move like rotate. Uh, so there are different actuator type of thing. There are different things technically you can do from a helistat, depend besides the cost. How can we calculate the receiver thermal power? So the receiver is a heat exchanger. As a heat exchanger, it is designed for a nominal power. And again, nominal means the rated power at the design conditions. So you can size the heat exchanger because it's just a heat exchanger. It's just that it's called receiver because it receives the power from the field. But it is on its own a heat exchanger. It's just that radiation is the, mo the main source of, of heat incoming. And, um, and you can, of course, if you go out to the market, it's not that you're going to buy a receiver in the supermarket, but the receivers, uh, there are companies that manufacture and sell receivers. And then they have specific rated powers that for which they have designed their receivers for. Today in the industry, you can get receivers of 300 megawatt thermal, of 565 megawatt thermal, of 780 megawatt thermal. So you have that like range there. You can also ask for a specific design for one if it turns out to be more efficient. Uh, efficient in terms of cost efficiency again. Is SAM a powerful tool for benchmarking studies? Yeah, I mean for any first design study, I think SAM is very good. For a very first design approach, uh, for the level of I mean, like where you are in engineering schools and so on, SAM is very powerful. And depending on the accuracy of the data, I mean the inputs of the cost and the rest of things, it can actually get very accurate. So it really depends on the inputs you put in. But the tool is powerful on its own. Um, when we can attend 80% of, uh, of capacity factor. So 80% is, if you remember today when, we were when I was showing real data from a plant, that plant is 80% capacity factor. We barely shut it down. And in the summer, it's 100% capacity factor. So that putting all the data together throughout the year is to give or take 75%, 80% capacity factor. So that's, it really depends on the ratio between solar field size, receiver size, storage size, and power block size. So if you have a, a relatively small power block cycle compared to a large storage and large field, you can attain a large capacity factor plant. You said that you teach this in five months. Please, where? Uh, well, uh, I teach mainly uh, in Sweden, 
and also in South Africa, but mainly in Sweden, which is my, universe, my home university. And, uh, credible s can you give us a credible source of information? Well, it's me. I, believe me, I do teach in Sweden. So, <laughs> so basically, if we don't input data on SAM, it gets random. Yeah, I mean, you need, to, you need to input the data and find sources for that. That's as any engineering work you do. Is SAM can be linked? Yes, it can be linked to metronome. So you can link SAM to metronome, get the TMY from metronome, <laughs> and then use SAM. You can use SAM with many software you, 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 you use on your own. So that was the last question. And I'm very happy to be here today with you. I hope you got the basic knowledge from Solar Energy. Thanks. <laughs>